Today we're going to be uh, uh, primarily covering the seventh chapter of Genesis, which is the, the chapter that describes the beginning of the flood anyway. Genesis 6.22 says, This did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Noah was obedient to God's word. What, what God told Noah to do, he did. And four times it is stated that Noah did all that God commanded him of him, and these are uh, listed here in 6.22, 7.5, 7.9, and 7.16. All say pretty much the same thing, that God was, or Noah was obedient to God's, uh, God's direction. And Noah demonstrated his faith by, of course, building, building an ark uh, according to God's specifications. And uh, Noah had now completed the ark. The, it, when we get to chapter 7, he had completed the ark. And uh, all the animals were assembling of coming to Noah to get onto the ark. And Methuselah, who Methuselah's name, remember, means that when he dies, the judgment will come. And Methuselah was uh, no doubt at this time on his de deathbed. And in Genesis 7, uh, 7, 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. The word that's, uh, uh, it says there that God saved Noah and all his house, but then on the other hand, didn't, didn't, wouldn't you th of think that Noah had more than just three sons? Because three sons ended up be, being the only ones on board. And does it mean that Noah had only three sons? Well, some people speculate that, that is, uh, that's, that's the case. But uh, other people speculate that God really, um, through grace, uh, extended his grace to all of Noah's children, and, but only three of them got on. And, uh, <clears throat> but uh, in other words, only three accepted God's invitation to, to board. And uh, the word here that's used here is, uh, is come. Of course, God says many times go. But in this case, come, and the idea there is that the Lord would be with them during the time that they were on the ark. And also that there would be protection of God during the time that they were, uh, that they were on the ark going through this flood. And as you'll see as we go through this lesson, protection is going to be very important. In verses 2 and 3 of chapter 7, it says, Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. It said, notice, it says clean beast here, and take to thee by sevens. Some people, some people feel that there are, uh, and the, the commentators are, both ways on this. Some say that there are seven clean animals. Some say there are seven pairs of clean animals. I honestly uh, don't know. I can tell you, though, that the, that the way that most people calculate how many animals are in the ark, they take seven pairs to make sure certain that no one criticizes that they didn't put enough animals on. It says, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female, of fowls also of the air by sevens, uh, and the male and the female. It kind of indicates more like there are seven pairs there. To keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. The purpose of having the animals on board is to keep seed alive upon the earth because when this flood occurs, everything that isn't on this ark is going to, is going to perish, is going to die. This, obviously, the ark, again, wouldn't be needed and you wouldn't have to keep the seed alive on the ark if this was just going to be a local flood. This is a worldwide, universal flood. The, uh, <clears throat> the, the thought about the clean beasts being seven uh, is for sacrifice, because sacrifices were going on at this particular time. Of course, that was uh, one of the issues right away uh, of what type of sacrifice would be done. 
And this, uh, and this, uh, the idea here is that these clean beasts were for, the reason there were more was for the purpose of sacrifice. And that's probably, I, I would think that that be probably correct. No one really knows what the clean beasts are at this time. People speculate, though, that they're the same animals that are listed in Leviticus 11th chapter. But, of course, that's not given until the law is placed into place, and this is long before that time. But uh, <clears throat> there isn't any indication up to this point in the uh, Old Testament of what clean beasts are actually, of what animals are actually the clean beasts. Chapter uh, 7, verses 4 and 5 says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living thing that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. So the <clears throat> Noah did according, and then it, it, it ends, verse 5, and Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. God gives his final warning. There's seven days left. Uh, these are, uh, obviously Noah would have to do anything last minute that he would have to do prior to getting on. The seven days could indicate that Methuselah had died and that, uh, uh, that there was a mourning period of seven days prior to the time of the flood. That is also uh, a good possibility, actually. But it says that rain would fall upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. This doesn't mean that it was just going to rain locally there. This, again, indicates that this is a worldwide thing. If it means that it was raining somewhere for 40 days, uh, let's face it, that's going on presently. I mean, it rains... As a matter of fact, if you think about it, I mean, it's raining somewhere on this earth all the time. I mean, it's continuous. It's not just 40 days. It's all the time. It's raining somewhere. So uh, it, it obviously indicates, though, that this rain is going to be 40 days and 40 nights on the entire earth. And we're going to talk about that in more detail here in a second. And it's going to go on for 40 days and 40 nights. The, the thought here by, by many, and I'm going to go into some detail here on this because this is kind of a controversial now, is the, uh, that the water canopy would, would fall as described on day two. I can tell you right up front, not everybody uh, believes that. And I'm going to talk in some detail about the criticisms of this here in a second. But... <clears throat> Uh, the waters above the atmosphere here that are in this water canopy as described here, atmosphere between the two and water on the earth, this is really, the, is really a slide pulled out of the second day of creation. This falls, and when that falls, it falls, falls to earth, and it, does, it falls everywhere on the earth at the same time. This... Uh, Canopy caused everything to be pretty mild, actually, because it's kind of a terrarium effect. And uh, that means that the climate is drastically going to change. As a matter of fact, it's drastically going to change to what we have, what we have today. Everything will be uh, killed on the surface of the earth. And uh, that includes not only animals, but a lot of the plants, of course, as we know, died also during this uh, time. In other words, Noah, when he got onto this ark, he was leaving life as he knew it. I mean, this, there's going to be huge changes because of this. That's why so many animals become extinct at the time. We're going to talk about that in more detail next week. But that's why so many become extinct at this time. It's going to be huge changes to the climate at this particular time. Drastic changes are going to occur on Earth. Verses 6 through 9, it says, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon, upon the earth. And Noah went in. 
his, his sons, his wife, his son's wife's with him, into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts, and of beasts that are not clean, and of fowls, and of everything that creepeth upon the earth, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. He, there, there's actually a list, of course, here of all of the animals that, are, that, are, uh, that go, go into the ark. It's, uh, you know, the list of the people, Noah and his, and his sons and their wives, uh, the clean beasts, beasts, birds, creeping things. They're all, uh, and as I said last time, the creeping things are, it, the word that's used there is the word for reptile in, in, uh, in Hebrews, in, in, the, in Hebrew. So, and it, and it says in, in verse 9 here, there, this is talking about these animals in verse 8. There went in, they go in. In other words, they go in on their own. It's not that Noah is dragging them, dragging a burrow up the, up the gangplank into this thing. I mean, they, they're going in on their own. It says, there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark. Unto Noah means that they came to Noah. In other words, there was migration, which we talked about last time. Migration occurred at this particular time that caused those animals that were going to be saved on the ark, which would be a male and a female of all species, to migrate to the ark, and then they would, uh, and they, they would lo load themselves onto the ark, and uh, the, Noah and his three sons really wouldn't have much to, uh, to do with that uh, particular process. Verses 13 through 16 says, In the very same day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark. We know that uh, after, after the time of the ark, Noah and his wife uh, apparently do not have any more children, and all of the people that are on earth today come from the three sons of Noah and their wives. Verse 14 says, they and every beast after its kind. Notice when they, in verse 14, when it says here, it lists the animal, but it says before it, either every or all, and then it says after its kind, after its kind, which indicates that all the species that were present on, on earth, uh, in the lithosphere, you might say, on dry land, were... Uh, getting onto the ark. So verse 14 says, they and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after its kind, every fowl after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two, and again, again look, notice verse 15 says, and they went in again unto Noah into the ark idea of migration here again. Uh, two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life. The breath of life again are those animals that breathe through nostrils. Uh, and they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him and as it says at the end, the Lord shut him in. The Bible lists all of the animal categories in detail. It lists them as to the species, uh, the kinds. This is the second time that the list is, is, is made here. And as I said, it states every or all with every one of them. And the emphasis is placed on this list probably because God knew that no one's going to believe this. <laughs> no, one's gonna, no one is going to believe that this really happened. So... For emphasis, he puts down a, every species is going to be there, and it's uh, and they're listed out uh, specifically. This event, though, is totally miraculous. I mean, God is in total charge of loading this ark. Noah and his sons, maybe they had a few things to do, but God is in charge of what is happening here when He directs these two animals of every species to the ark 
and directs them onto the ark itself. That's God's doing. It's a miracle. It's, a, it's miraculous. It's supernatural. Uh, the passage indicates that the animals, as I said, migrated to the ark when it says Noah, they came unto Noah. Uh, they were, in other words, Noah and his sons didn't have to go out and round up the animals and bring them to the ark and, and uh, sort them out and try to figure out who's male and who's female, that type of thing. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they came unto, unto Noah. So, and it really states that Noah, as it says here in verse 13, what does it say Noah did? He entered into the ark. With all these other people, he entered into the ark. It doesn't say that he did anything more than enter into the ark. And as a matter of fact, the verse we just looked at, it says Noah went into the ark. That's what he did. So uh, there was a tremendous amount, in other words, that God did here as, uh, in, as, as God's all-powerful and he causes these animals to migrate. Now, God, to, to show that God is in charge here is the last phrase here. The Lord shut him in. So actually, God himself closes the door and seals the door so it's watertight, so the water doesn't flood the ark. And uh, uh, God actually does that. Verses 10 through 12, it says, And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, now there, uh, <clears throat> the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. So two things happen. All the fountains uh, of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So, so there's two different opinions of what's being said here. Uh, some people say that Noah was 600 years old, two months and 17 days when this occurred. Uh, however, if you look at this, and other people will say that this is the year in which Noah hit 600 years, his birthday, in other words, his 600-year birthday was that particular year, and it was in the second month, the 17th day of the month, that's the calendar. Whatever the case is, it gives a specific day that this, that this, that this occurred here. When all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. It gives a specific day. Uh, if, you, if you take this second month to mean that's the Jewish calendar. Of course, the Jewish calendar isn't around at this particular time, and it's not. It's pretty far off in the future, actually. But if you take take it, but on the other hand, this uh, the book of Genesis was was written for the Jewish nation. So uh, uh, if you take that as to mean this the second month, seventeenth day of the Jewish calendar. Uh, the month, if the months during Noah's time are similar to that, uh, it would be a lunar month, not a, uh, not a solar month. To calculate, you got to, so a lot of people try to calculate how long the people were on the ark, and there's a little bit number difference between how you calculate what a month is. And, uh, uh, but if you take it that way, the flood actually started in November or December. Uh, somewhere around November or December. Actually, I would agree with that based on the amount of ice that was present in the Northern Hemisphere at that particular time. Uh, so I would lean towards that, actually. But it says the, uh, uh, in one day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Well, the key to understanding how this happened is realizing what the fountains of the deep are and what are the windows of heaven. Well, the fountains of the deep, they're, uh, keep in mind that the hydrological cycle during the antediluvian period, which this is, is described in Genesis 2nd chapter. 
It's different than what we have today. The waters in the rivers are supplied, the waters in the rivers, as it's described in Genesis 2, are supplied by the fountains of the deep. In other words, the headwaters of the rivers are larger at their origin and they get smaller as they run into the land, much like an irrigation system. They, it states specifically that out of the Garden of Eden, a river came forth and it broke into what are, would be called distributaries. In other words, now we have tributaries, tributaries coming together and then forming like the Mississippi River, the Ohio dumps into it, the Missouri dumps into it, and goes down, and of course, dumps into the Gulf of Mexico, and it gets larger and larger as it goes. Think about that in, uh, in opposite terms. The river is huge at its beginning, and then it splits into these other tributaries, and that's what's described in Genesis second chapter. The, uh, and then the water and the sea interconnects to the river origins through these great fountains, or the fountains of the great deep. The energy to keep this cycle going, because how, how, how does the water get back and everything else? Well, it's heat. And the heat of the earth's mantle, these, it says, fountains of the great deep. So these are very, very deep channels of water that go back to supply the headwaters of all these rivers. So <clears throat> keep in mind, this is what breaks up. This is what, what God causes to break up. And the... Uh, uh, it's, it's, if you keep in mind that it's like an irrigation system, where an irrigation system, of course, is forcing water out, and then it breaks into the various different channels that are going to irrigate the land. That's kind of how it was prior to the time of the flood. <clears throat> now, how about the windows of heaven were open? This is the second. There's two phrases here, the fountains of the great deep, and now the windows of heaven. Well, what was that? Well, I'd say those were the waters above the firmament. Uh, in other words, the uh, invisible water vapor canopy, which was high in the, uh, in the atmosphere. Remember that this thing is invisible because it's water vapor is in the form of a gas here. I'm going to get into some of the criticisms here of this in a second. <clears throat> but it's, uh, this is, was formed in day two of creation, and it falls here as rain. It falls all over the entire world or as, as rain. I can tell you that uh, uh, several people have criticized this, and as a matter of fact, Answers in Genesis has this listed as something that she shouldn't be teaching anymore, the vapor canopy. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway because I'm going to tell you why here in a second. <laughs> Because I think it's still a valid, uh, valid argument, and I've read all of their criticisms of it, and I'm not going to go into detail of why every one of their criticisms is wrong, but uh, they're, not, they're not right on this. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're not. I'm, I'm open that maybe it's different, but on the other hand, the arguments that they're using do not, uh, do not hold water, you might say. <laughs> But this is Ken Ham's group, uh, actually, and, and it's, it, it's a very good group. I'm not saying it isn't, and I would be interested in talking to some of the people about it, actually. Maybe they could convince me different, but they claim that a canopy, first off, this the canopy over the earth would cause the earth to be too warm. And uh, they take some data that was uh, written by the Institute of Creation Research, which is the, uh, another big group in San Diego. And uh, they had an article come out and uh, claimed that the, the, uh, the canopy wouldn't work because it would be too warm. I might say that they used a computer program back in the late 1980s, early 90s, that uh, the uh, atmospheric people were, and the climatologists were using to predict global warming. And uh, so that, that's a red flag for me. Uh, and that's the global warming uh, uh, 
a program, that's computer program, uh, predicted the, uh, the hockey stick type thing where they said that everything was just going to take off and warm. That's the program that they used that claimed that the canopy was, was, was going to cause the earth to be too hot. I'm not sure that's right. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll show you some stuff on global warming here in a second. It's kind of a sidetrack, but... But uh, even this computer program that they used and they, they have, they, uh, um, Ken Ham's group did uh, reference in their book, Answers in Genesis, uh, or I, there's a book that they essentially answer a lot of questions in. And uh, uh, they reference this, this uh, article. But it's uh, uh, but it that that was kind of a red flag to me. I did read the original article, and there are and I should probably do it in some Sunday school, and uh, just tell you why I don't think it's correct. I looked at it pretty critically, but anyway, uh, this is this is some information that just came out. This is 2015 here, and this is coming out by the. NOAA, uh, but th this sh shows what some of these programs will show. Now, you can see, by the way, this is 1950s here. I was in grade school in the 1950s, and what were they talking about here with these lines below this line? We were, they were talking about coming the Ice Age. I remember it. I remember it like in third, fourth grade, they were talking about Ice Age coming. That's because these numbers were down here. And, and since that time, <clears throat> as you can see, it's, it's increased. And there, there's a lot, there's people all over the place on this. But the thing I want to draw your attention to here, a lot of people see these lines, but they don't realize what the, what the scale is. See what that scale is? Zero, one. That's one degree Fahrenheit. That's what we're talking about here. One degree Fahrenheit change in the entire globe. And after this, this, we're seeing a 1.2 degree Fahrenheit change in this Earth. That's like the difference between 70 and 71 degrees. It's not big. <laughs> and there, and you know, this is, this is where politics has kind of hijacked science. And this has become so political you can't hardly even find the real numbers anymore. You just can't do it. It's very difficult to figure this out. But anyway, this, this is one of the programs, and uh, the reason I'm kind of off on the side here, but, but uh, uh, we're talking 50 years here, just uh, 50 years from here to there for essentially a one degree Fahrenheit change. Maybe that's significant. I don't know, but it doesn't seem huge to me. So, I'm not throwing the canopy under the bus. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not willing to throw it under at this particular time. The reason, the reasons why I don't. Well, we know from the fossil record that the earth was much warmer in the past. I mean, anybody that, anybody that reads anything about this will know that the so-called age of the dinosaurs, of course, the age of the dinosaurs is when, uh, when Noah's alive here prior to the time of the flood. That is the age of the dinosaurs. But the, but the fossils will tell us that it was warm at that particular time. And a canopy of water vapor would cause widespread mild temperatures. No matter what these guys say, it would. And uh, uh, the, uh, there's a quotation here, and it's, this is a very interesting quotation. This, by the way, this Kump guy, he, he's, he's an evolutionist. He's not, you know, not a creationist at all. But he says that the mid-Cretaceous climate, the Cretaceous is when the dinosaurs were supposedly here by evolution, if you trace back, six, 65 million years ago was on the order of two to six degrees. With, he's got centigrade, but if you convert it to Fahrenheit, it's about three and a half to 11 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer at the equator. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is, look what it is at the poles. It is 36 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit warmer at the poles. 
up to 110 degrees warmer at the poles. What's their explanation for this? They have no explanation. That's the, that's the fact. I'd like to know what the answers in Genesis explanation is for this. Because when you remove a canopy, for instance, the poles go to the temperatures there they are right now. The South Pole, it's, it's like 50 below there. It, and it, it's below zero there all the time. I mean, it, all the time. It, it, it never warms up. So, and, there, and of course, there are people here in Rochester who have gone to the South Pole, and I know, I know one of them very, very well. And it's, it's like the worst day of the winter all the time there, even in the summertime. So uh, you have to get 100, you have to get about 100 degrees to even get things up to about 50 or 60 degrees to melt to melt the ice cap. So, uh, but this is, an, the, the reason I got this on here, this is, a, this is an evolutionist here. This is a fossilized tree taken from Antarctic ice. You can see rings in it. That tree is under ice. There's one to two miles of ice on the surface of Antarctica. And below that, there are trees that are this big. Well, how did these trees grow? if there was not mild temperatures all over the entire world. Even evolutionists admit, without explanation by the way, that Antarctica was once warm. You can find, uh, find uh, trees and animals and everything else down underneath that ice. So, I don't know what their explanation is, but uh, I, I'm, I just, can't, uh, I just don't know of another way of explaining it or another easy way of explaining it. I might, I might add too that the canopy theory really has been around a long time but was really proposed and really put forth a lot by Henry Morris who was a professor of physics and he was, he was a hyd hydrologist. His area was hydrology, in other words, water, the physics of water and he was a professor of physics at the University of Minnesota. He's the one that wrote uh, the Genesis Flood with John Whitcomb. He's the one that pushed this uh, forward. So I'm not so sure I'm ready to, you know, as I say, throw it under the bus yet. Another reason for not throwing the canopy under the bus is that it increases the atmospheric pressure. That is an important thing. A canopy of water vapor would cause an increase in atmospheric pressure. This has been criticized also, but I can tell you it creates a healthier environment. And there's been all kinds of things that have been written about this that are false also. One of them saying that they, they be, because there would be a higher oxygen content, there wouldn't be by the way, but if there was, that causes uh, blindness in babies and that type. We happened to work on that at Mayo Clinic. When, when I was there, 40 years or 35 years I was at Mayo Clinic. I can tell you that the blindness in the neonates that c occurs because of that is because they were running in 100% oxygen. Well, nobody says that this canopy and the increase in atmospheric pressure would cause 100% oxygen in the atmosphere. It won't. That's what, that's what gets the retinal changes in babies, 100% oxygen, high oxygen contents in other words. But this does, it is healthier and it's used as a treatment for patients all over the whole United States right now uh, for chronic chronic wounds that won't heal because increasing atmospheric pressure drives oxygen into the, uh, into, into the uh, tissues and they will heal more rapidly. <clears throat> it also explains how a lot of these animals that can't survive in our atmosphere now and are fossilized in the record, they are there. These are real animals and how they can survive now when they couldn't serve, or they wouldn't be able to survive in our atmosphere now, how they could survive. Increased atmospheric pressure will cause these animals to survive. One of them, 
are dragonflies that are gigantic. They're, they have two foot wingspans. Two foot wingspan of, of a dragonfly insect cannot fly in this atmosphere. But in an increased atmospheric pressure, it can. Same thing is true of the, uh, of the flying reptiles, the, the, the uh, pterosaurs, which are, which are the flying, flying reptiles, which are now all extinct. But these animals aerodynamically cannot fly in this atmosphere. You increase the atmospheric pressure, they can. Also, there's invertebrates. This is a millipede that is, uh, this is a model of a millipede though. But uh, they've, they've found these uh, things that are eight feet long. It's an invertebrate though. Invertebrates cannot be that large in this particular atmosphere. Because, and what, what do, how does evolution explain this? Well, they, they, they claim that the oxygen content was higher back at the time that these animals were, were alive so that they could, could uh, live because they realized that they can't live in this particular atmosphere because our oxygen content's too low. Uh, because they're an invertebrate, they don't, have, they, don't, uh, they don't have the same kind of lung system that we do. But uh, uh, increased atmospheric pressure, again, these animals can, can live. So I'm not, ready to, uh, I'm not ready to abandon the canopy theory. But what, getting back to the flood, what happens on the day that uh, God judges man for sin? Well, the waters that are above and below the, uh, uh, the canopy, that the, these waters which were separated on day two, essentially are brought back together. That's what happens. And uh, that's the simplest explanation. The waters which were divided on day two are brought, are brought back together. In other words, that, uh, that waters that were in the atmosphere, above the atmosphere, within the atmosphere, the waters below, which are the fountains of the deep, are pushed onto the earth's surface under pressure, and the waters above come down as rain. So, in this process, I, as I said, God's power is totally involved with every aspect and detail about this judgment. This judgment of water by God is totally miraculous. It, uh, uh, it has no explanation based on natural law. And I'm going to go into detail with that in a second here, but it's, it's not a natural event. God negates natural law to cause this to occur. In other words, it's a miracle. If you look up miracle in the dictionary, you'll find it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful event. This isn't a wonderful event, but it's still a miracle. Because the other, the other, uh, the other definition is it's an effect in the physical world that surpasses all known natural powers. And that's true. It's God's supernatural, omnipotent power at work here. And he uses essentially his creative power that he created everything out of nothing. He creates, he uses that same power to judge this earth because of man's, of man's sin to cause total destruction. We don't think of that as a miracle, but this is. This is a miraculous event. And uh, God, by the way, will uh, do this again in the future. Uh, oops. I must have gone though. Must have gone the wrong way. There it is. Second Peter three seven. It's going to be in the future the same thing, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, that's the ones now. Peter's. This is Peter. Uh, by the same word, I kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of godly men. Reserved under fire. There's going to be global warming. All right. It's going to be a miraculous global warming because God's going to judge this earth again and he's going to judge it with fire. But Genesis 7.11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So the breaking up of the fountains of the deep the crust of the earth is broken into the tectonic plates that we see today. You know, if you look at it, we're, we're sitting right in here, of course. 
But there's these huge tectonic plates, the Pacific plate, of course. You can see Australian plate here, a Philippine plate here. But these huge tectonic plates, and what God does is he breaks apart, essentially, the crust of the earth into these, into these fault lines and these huge tectonic plates. And how, how does he do that? Well, it's a miracle. It's, he, there's, there's, no, there's no known source of power we know of that could do this, except God does, it. God does this. And this is the first event. He fractures the earth's crust into large faults, in other words. And uh, uh, he causes, this causes, of course, worldwide earthquakes, uh, because that's what the earthquakes are from, from the movement of these plates. That's what causes an earthquake. There's the San Andreas Fault right there, right down the side of California. So, uh, <clears throat> the, and when these break apart, Remember, the fountains of the deep become under, they're under pressure. They, of course, just uh, water shoots high into the air. Uh, also from these volcanic, uh, from these uh, cracks, uh, the magma from the Earth's mantle comes through, the molten rock. So there's volcanic eruptions, which uh, dust is uh, expelled high into the atmosphere, molten rock onto the Earth's surface. This is occurring not only on land, but up below the water, so there's boiling of the water uh, that are over these uh, volcanic eruptions that are taking place. And then the, uh, uh, and all of this is miraculous. I mean, God does this through his own power. There's no reason that this, uh, this, this occurs. And the second thing is that the windows of heaven were opened. In other words, there's pouring down a torrential rain everywhere on earth. And the, wa the water vapor canopy w becomes unstable because of all the dust that's present there and the, uh, of the atmosphere, the uh, water into the atmosphere, and the f canopy falls as rain. Now, another person, another thing that answers in Genesis will say right away, this is impossible because they criticize this canopy because the latent heat from the phase change of the condensation of water vapor to water, there's a phase change from a gas to a liquid here because there, there's a, the water vapor is a gas, goes to a liquid and falls as rain. That produces heat, latent heat. If you calculate that all off, you'd get so much heat that the water boils on the surface. The interesting thing is, is when you look at that, though, and you start looking at that with the Bible and, and trying to figure this out, there's no natural explanation of how God caused the fountains of the deep to break up. They'll admit that, too. So why does the second phrase, which just follows in the same verse, the windows of heaven were opened, require that natural law dictate this process? As I said, this is miraculous. God negates natural law. If he negates natural law, how, why, doesn't the, why doesn't the water on earth boil? It, because it's a miracle. It's, it's like, it's, it, it, think, of, think of the miracle when God, uh, when Jesus turns water into wine. You can't figure that out. I mean, it's water in the pot. And when they dip in and pull it out, it becomes wine. How does that happen? It's a miracle. So is this. <laughs> so it doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be explained by natural law because God negates natural law when he when he judges this earth. People think of miracles as something. Oh, it's got to be wonderful. No, it's a negation of natural law, and that's what's happening when God when God judges this earth and judges man for, for sin. So the windows of heaven. Well, the word for windows there is aruba, the Hebrew word. It means window. It also means, uh, in, the, in the case of smoke, it means ch a chimney, for instance. But in the case of water, it means a sluice. It's a word that we don't use very often around here. But uh, 
it's, it's a sluice. And what's, what's a sluice? Well, a, the idea of a sluice is a body of water being held back behind a floodgate. It's like the floodgates here. This is a sluice here where the water's shooting through. And that's the idea. And it, it means to pour, gush, surge, flood. And it's, uh, uh, that's the idea. In other words, when these windows of heaven are opened, there's a tremendous amount of water that comes down. Now, where's that water coming from? Well, I would say some of it's coming from the canopy. Does all of it come from the canopy? I don't know. It's, a, it's, it's miraculous. So could God contribute water at that particular time? Of course he could. He can turn water into wine. He can contribute water to this, to this uh, point. So, so a lot of these, and I know that a lot of scientists are going to say, well, you're just bailing out. You can't explain this, so you just say God. No, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm interpreting what it says in this book, in the Word of God. The beginning of the flood was not like this. You know, you've got a couple guys standing here, you know, watching. The ark is over here. Look, look at the way the ark. The ark looks like a barge. It doesn't look like this thing. And it's kind of floating away here, and there's a bunch of animals struggling for life here. And, you know, the clouds are like this. You can't even you hardly see any rain here. That's not how it is. I mean, this, this torrential rain occurs. The waters from the deep are broken up. Animals are dying immediately. I mean, we've got mammoths and mastodons stuck, frozen in ice under the ice pack in, in the Arctic. Some of them have food in their mouth. They're eating during the time. They're frozen solid. They're frozen in seconds because the meat is so well preserved. It's meat scientists say it takes seconds. You have to freeze that in seconds to do that. So those, the, from, when, you, when you look at this, it's, it, these, these depictions are wrong. People are dying immediately when this occurs. Now, 17 through 20, and I'll probably, probably end with this, but, uh, and the flood was 40 days upon the, uh, upon the earth. The waters increased. Just get an idea of what it says. Okay, this is the flood. The waters increased, bore up the ark. By the way, boring up the ark takes about 20 feet of water to get the ark off the ground by calculations. It was lifted up above the earth. The waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. The ark went upon the face of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth. And all the high hills that were under the whole heaven high hills, all, all high hills under the whole heaven were covered 15 cubits upward, that's about 22 and a half feet, did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. By the way, the word for, uh, the Hebrew word for hills and the Hebrew word for mountains are exactly the same word, har. Uh, so this is really the same, but in other words, everything is totally covered. You know, there's no way this is a local flood. Most people who believe in local floods, I mean, they're not, they're not looking at what's written in the Bible, I'll tell you that. Because there's no, I mean, how many more ways can you say this than have been said here that this was a, it was a total uh, disastrous, uh, disastrous judgment for, for anybody who's not on the ark. Let's, uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I've got some more st stuff from verse, or chapter 7 here. I'll cover that at the beginning of next week, and then we'll finish up with the flood. I'll, I'll go through a lot of the results of the flood next, uh, next, next time.